Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Ben Rhodes, and today we have a three-part show for you. That's right, uh, triple the content. First, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the latest news out of Israel and Gaza, uh, but then I will be speaking with Prime Minister Jonas Gar Stoda, the Prime Minister of Norway, who took the uh, significant decision uh, this past week to recognize a Palestinian state alongside Spain and Ireland. He'll talk a bit about what that decision means, why he made it, and how he sees the future. Um, of a potential Palestinian state. Then you will hear my conversation with Freed Zakaria, a uh, journalist, author of the new book, Age of Revolutions. Uh, Freed was my co-host uh, to talk about a variety of different issues. We talk about the situation in Israel. We talk about uh, Russia and Ukraine. We talk about Taiwan and China. Uh, so we kind of step back and take the lay of the land on all of these global hotspots that we've been talking about on the podcast. Um, I want to note, Freed and I pre-taped our conversation on Friday, May 24th, um, so it doesn't reflect all of the things that have happened since then, and things obviously move very quickly, but actually the utility in talking to a guy like Freed is, is that ability to step back, and he had a lot of smart things to say about the Middle East, about Russia, China, and, and his new book, which is really, truly extraordinary. Um, and then we talked to Ravi Gupta. He is the host of a new limited series from Crooked Media and The Branch called Killing Justice. Uh, I've been involved in this series. I've listened to the first three episodes. They're incredible. You should check that out. We'll talk about this mysterious case of a judge's murder uh, in India, the difficulty of getting to the truth, and what it says about where India and Indian democracy is going. Before we get to my interview with the Prime Minister, though, I do want to just uh, bring people up to speed on a really terrible uh, tragedy that took place on Sunday. Um, over 45 civilians were killed and more than 200 injured in an Israeli strike on a displacement camp in Rafa that ignited a huge fire. Uh, if you've seen any of this, um, it's absolutely unimaginable um, suffering inside you know, a tent camp. Uh, we've seen just charred bodies of, of civilians. Uh, we've seen uh, children killed, uh, a beheaded child. Um, the worst kind of scenes of, of civilian suffering and war that, that one can imagine. Uh, the Israeli government has said that the strike was targeting two Hamas leaders, um, but Netanyahu did come out and call the death toll and the, the circumstances of the strike a tragic mistake and said that they're investigating, that the IDF is investigating. Um, the Israelis say that their munitions alone couldn't have caused the massive fire and are looking into all possibilities, including the option that weapons stored in a compound next to the target may have ignited as a result of the strike. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, that's also not all. Palestinian officials say at least 29 people were killed in two separate strikes in Rafa on Tuesday. Um, Israeli tanks were rolling to the center of Rafa for the first time. And, and according to UNRWA, um, which uh, was in charge of that facility that uh, was burnt, um, one million people have now left Rafa over the last few weeks. Um, I think that we'll talk more about this next week with Tommy. I think the one thing I'm just, I would offer on this is this is exactly why people said that they should not go into Rafa, because things like this were going to happen, because they've happened in the other places uh, where Israel's done these kind of ground invasion. Uh, and whatever you're doing, um, if you are lighting tent encampments with children in it, in an area that was a declared safe zone, that Israel had said was a safe zone, um, then, then you're doing something deeply, profoundly, morally wrong. And the fact that it came you know, less than, I don't know, a couple of days after the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, demanded uh, a halt to Israel's Rafa operation, uh, less than a week after the ICC um, sought arrest warrants for the prosecution of Israel's political leadership uh, for war crimes. I just, you know, sometimes uh, you run out of words to describe this conflict. Um, People need to, to look at what's happening with their eyes, and we can see what's happening in Rafa. It doesn't in any way diminish the horror of what Hamas did. We, you know, there, there's space for these two things to be true, that this military operation is gone profoundly wrong in a dark, dark way, which we saw most acutely recently in Rafa. And that's something that the U.S. has to wrestle with. And, and look, I, don't, I have a, my own history with the phrase red line, um, sometimes it's an oversimplification of complicated issues. In this case, President Biden suggested that going into Rafa would be a red line for him, kind of suggesting some kind of cutoff of support. Um, 
the one thing you cannot argue is that somehow they're not in Rafa. Uh, they're, they're bombing Rafa. They're killing civilians in Rafa. They're tanks in Rafa. What, what, uh, is this, if this is not an operation in Rafa, then I don't know what is. So can we please just kind of dispense with the semantic games about whether some red line has been crossed? It has. The question is, what is the U.S. going to do about it? And uh, I believe that it's past time uh, to, to be much clearer in where we stand in terms of restricting uh, military assistance that's not purely defensive, like air defense, missile defense systems, to be voting for ceasefires at the U.N. There are a lot of things that can be done um, to try to send a message that this war needs to end and we need to get towards a two-state solution. That leads me into my conversation with a leader who's doing that work, the Prime Minister of Norway. Uh, check out the interview here. We are very pleased uh, to welcome to Pod Save the World uh, a leader that uh, I've long admired um, and uh, who's uh, taken, uh, I think, a very uh, practical and brave uh, stance this week, Prime Minister of Norway, Jonas Garstoda. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Good to be with you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you, uh, in coordination with uh, Spain and Ireland, uh, over the course of the last week, uh, Norway has uh, joined uh, many other nations in recognizing uh, a Palestinian state. Tell me a bit about why you took this decision uh, to take this step of formal recognition of, of Palestine uh, and how it came about that you did this in coordination with uh, Ireland and Spain as well. Well, there's a, there's a long story, you know, about timing. This is not exact science. Uh, uh, why was this done 70 years ago or 30 years ago or you know, Norway, since the Oslo Accords in 1993, we have been supporting and actively supporting a process towards what would end up as two states living side by side. And 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 the uh, the intention was that um, recognition of Palestine, formal recognition of Palestine, would happen as part of a broad between Israel and Palestine. Now, that has not happened uh, year after year. Uh, still, it has been an objective for Norway's part. We we have said over the last years that it was not necessarily linked to such a final peace agreement, but it had to come at the right moment. So why is this the right moment? And this is, of course, also linked to the tragic war unfolding in Gaza after the terror on the 7th of October, the Hamas terror, the war unfolding. And what is emerging from the international community is that after this war, after the ceasefire, the release of hostages, there has to be a new political track towards a two-state solution, something which is Palestine secured in uh, principles based on international law living alongside Israel. So our objective was to say that this is the moment to send that signal to Palestinians. You are not forgotten. You are not doomed to be dominated by Hamas, militant groups and violence downward spiral of your economy. So the paradox now is that we have never been farther away on the ground, I would say, to have two states living side by side in peace. But politically, there's a new momentum coming from the US, from Europe, from the Arab states. And, and we simply, you know, this is a conflict that has implications all over the world. And we simply have, uh, yeah, as we are responsible citizens, we have to take decisions that would create a new dynamic um, from a very, you know, complex point of departure, but that's why we believe it was right. Why Spain and Ireland? Well, I don't, to do this as a one-off, as one country, I think would be a missed opportunity. Madrid and Oslo were important to kick off yeah. what happened, you know, with the Oslo process. So there's some message in Spain and uh, Norway, Ireland came along, and I believe there will be more European states also coming in the near future. Yeah, I, I thought actually the symbolism was quite powerful of Spain and Norway, given how central Madrid and Oslo were to the basically what we know is the peace process. Um, and I, I was going to follow up on this question of what happens next, because uh, the U.S. position for a long time has been, uh, I use <laughs> these talking points for eight years. They were used before me. They have been used after me. Uh, we believe that the two-state solution should be negotiated by the parties, and we don't like steps that go, you know, around that process. Essentially, um, now clearly that has failed. Um, I, I and I and I think you know in some ways Norway taking this step, it, it, it's pretty profound because it's kind of signaling, you know, it's been you know, what thirty years since Oslo, but but it is kind of saying, guys, this is not working, um, and there, we need to be open to different approaches. And it, I think if you assess the landscape now, you have an Israeli government that rejects a Palestinian state. You have well, in Hamas, a Palestinian uh, part of the Palestinian leadership rejects Israel. Uh, the Palestinian Authority accepts it. You've got this 
Abraham Accords process that kind of ignored the Palestinians, and you have this kind of direct recognition of Palestine um, by now 140 plus countries at the United Nations. Where do you see these pieces? I mean, I know you're kind of someone who thinks about the puzzle pieces of geopolitics. Where, where do you see this going forward? What is the role of Europe? Because in the past, I think, you know, Europe, you know, the U.S. pressured Europe to not do things like this. What does this say about the role of Europe in trying to address a situation in which kind of U.S. brokered peace talks are clearly not working? Well, first of all, on foreign policy in general, I mean, on your podium, you discuss, you know, foreign policy, how do you exercise it? And I think it is with foreign policy, like many other areas of life. If you do this, keep on doing the same thing year after year and it fails, at some stage you have to say, okay, is changing a course, is it a profound change or is it simply trying to reach your objectives with other means? And for my case, Norway's case, it is the latter. Because we have always, you know, a Tuesday solution will not be an easy thing, but you have to hold it against the alternative, which is what we have seen now, downward spiral. And honestly speaking, you know, the other alternative, a one-state solution where people would live inside one state, that would have to be on the basis of equal rights. And that will not happen. I mean, Israel is against the two-state solution and against that other option. And that's why what I'm saying is that, yes, there is a change to opposition. It has not worked. And now we have a government in Israel that openly says it will not uh, support it. So what is the puzzle then? I, as I see it, you know, the way the, I, I acknowledge the complexity of being American administration now, it is a very complex task. And I, I respect that. I, I, I've heard President Biden's very clear message about the two-state solution. And I think with the Arab states, you know, what they are doing now is to, there there are Abraham Accords, but there is also upgrading the 2002 Arab Peace Plan which basically says that we, the Arab world, now much more profoundly, we will live with Israel. We will respect Israel. We will recognize Israel, normal relations. But this is the triangle. The, the other part, uh, the second part of the triangle is that we have to recognize that part which is called Palestine. If you don't do that, you will, you will continue to be hampered by violence and downward spiral. And the third part is, you know, the way the U.S. will play its role in this region, you know, ranging from security guarantee arrangements, presence. And, you know, Norway chaired this meeting alongside this weekend, alongside Saudi Arabia, a meeting of Arab ministers and European ministers on this issue. So I believe here there is a dynamic which the U.S. actually can use, because this is something we have to put together as pieces, both as regards Gaza, what will Gaza be in the future, how do we take care of a Palestinian authority which need to reform profoundly? And that was the second meeting Norway chaired this weekend because we chaired the donor support group with Deputy Secretary from the U.S. Kurt Campbell present, giving a very strong address of how we have to support the reforms of the new Palestinian administrations. So there are many puzzle pieces in these puzzles, and we just have to work on them side by side. But for me, fundamentally, the day after this war, when we start to, to look ahead, we avoid to have this every second year. Palestinians deserve the integrity of what statehood gives around the notion of Palestine, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And and that, I believe, is giving hope to people in Gaza and not, not to forget the West Bank, which is really now in a very dire situation. And, you know, I keep telling my Israeli friends, if you let the PA collapse, if you go yeah. on as you do on the West Bank, you're going to have also on that side. Yeah, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you, you uh, chaired these meetings uh, in you know, the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee. This is a collection of, of countries that are providing assistance to the Palestinians. Um, it, it, it's interesting when you think about it, the, 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 if you go around essentially like a peace process that in my experience, uh, under Prime Minister Netanyahu at least, it was often you know, meant to play for time, you know, nothing happens, they build more settlements, they change facts on the ground in the West Bank. That's my view. On that. But um, the thing about recognition and assistance is, you, you know, in a way, you kind of have to just start building the Palestinian state in the West Bank in particular, um, instead of kind of waiting for some negotiated process that, that there's a clearly a need. I mean, what do you see as the, 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 the needs for on the Palestinian leadership side, how do you build something that is representative of the Palestinians that is responsive to their concerns, that addresses some of these issues around corruption, and frankly, some of these issues around just an elderly leadership that's kind of been somewhat humiliated by Israel over the years? I mean, 
what do you see as the most important ways in which donor countries, and that's often going to be Europe and Arab states, can contribute to a different Palestinian leadership than Hamas or a kind of Palestinian authority that feels um, a, like it needs a bit of a you know 2.0 version? Well, let's be fair about history here. I mean, uh, the leadership on the Palestinian side, if you go back to 2005, you know, they were people who were, I think, honest people. They were non violent they, res- they recognized Israel. They wanted to respect, uh, you know, UN resolutions. I was foreign minister at the time. I worked alongside Prime Minister Sanam Fayyad, who was an able, you know, guy that put the economy back on track. In 2011, uh, in September, uh, you know, there was one flag going up ahead of the UN building of a new state. That was South Sudan, which could, was not very able to run itself. Uh, it could have been Palestine, because at the time, the World Bank and the IMF said that, you know, they run their economy in a decent way. Uh, and still, it has gone the wrong, it has just gone down, downwards. And, you know, we now know that this has been partly the objective of, of successive Israeli governments. Yes, yes, I totally agree. To d- divide and rule the Palestinians, uh, uh, divide the Palestinians, uh, to say to the international community, we have no counterpart. And of course, Hamas has a tremendous responsibility for spoiling these process, processes. And, you know, some are saying that recognizing Palestine now would be the wrong signal to Hamas. I would say the contrary. Hamas is against Israel. We are in favor. Hamas is against two-state solution. We are in favor. Hamas is in favor of violence. We are against. So we have to give the Palestinian again this integrity that comes from UN resolution, from normal statehood, uh, and then the Palestinian Authority. You know, uh, being prime minister there now is it extremely complex. They have to reform. Their leadership has been there. You know, how could you hold elections in these areas uh, over the successive years? But obviously, there has to be reform and renewal and moving ahead. On, on major fronts, I, I know about it. So is it going to be easy? No. But I think, you know, the point of departure to say that we have clear expectations to you, Palestinian Authority. We will support you, but here is what we also want you to, the direction we want you to move in. And what about the U.S. as the one country that has some amount of leverage, uh, or at least the most amount of leverage on Israel? Um, I mean, if you listen to the podcast, you know I have my frustrations with this. Um but I know you're a close friend of the U.S. Uh, on so many issues and worked uh, hand in glove on Ukraine. Um, I, I'm just wondering how you would express, you know, as a friend, uh, how concerned are you that uh, one about just the, the the U.S. kind of continuing to provide pretty significant support to Israel in this war, but also kind of you know the 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 danger of the U.S. being so out of step with what seems like world opinion um, and so out of step with organizations like the ICC and the ICJ. Um, how should we Americans think about the risks to to the kind of status quo approach, like you said, that that we keep doing, even though it doesn't keep working? Well, Ben, I mean, uh, from your years in the administration, I think you know that Norway really puts itself in an on the global pop- podcast, giving advice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, on the Middle East, let me say this, the Oslo Accords led to Oslo because there was this very close and trusted co- coordination between Norway and the US. And and obviously what we have done by recognizing is something that the US is not doing at the moment. We have explained, we agree on the objective, but you know, we saw this as the right step for us to move now. I actually this is a very complex role they're in. I think, you know, they have to go on and give very clear signals. There has to be some conditions with those signals. And what has happened now in Rafa, what happens around these international court issues, that, you know, has profound implications, I think, on Europe. And I would like to see, you know, nobody will ever question that the U.S. is there as a guarantor for Israel. Um, and, you know, I hear this government in, 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 in Israel talking about all those who are against them and enemies against them. I think, you know, Israel in its foundation has pretty solid support, you know, for being a state, living in a complex environment, be, living in a very, you know, with Iran and all the rest of it. We are online there. But, you know, when, when, when we do as we do is that we see that moving ahead, as we have done in previous years, is a disaster for the Palestinians. It is decreasing security for the Israelis. And it has profound ramifications beyond uh, uh, the reach. And there is where the U.S. comes in, and I, I still wish to have a world where the U.S. have a profound say. And the role and the word and the action of the U.S. really weighs in. And that's why I really hope that, you know, we will be able to, 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 to end the war and then to move on to that next chapter, 
which I want to see our recognition really as for the next chapter. As an investment in, in you know, a different approach that might accelerate a Palestinian state uh, in reality. Uh, I do want to just ask you one question uh, on Ukraine, because um, you've been so out front on that issue as well. Um, you know, it, it, we're in this moment when it feels like uh, the battlefield momentum has shifted a bit against the Ukrainians. Um, President Zelensky's kind of been appealing for additional support, uh, additional uh, kinds of weapon systems, or perhaps help in shooting things down. Um, but in general, it just feels like there's a, a, a status quo that is, is a bit uncomfortable. Um, wh where do you see the war right now? And, and, and what kind of things, either politically or militarily, do you think Ukraine supporters need to at least consider going forward to try to to shake the momentum in a better direction? Well, first think about it, that Ukraine has been able to hold back, you know, uh, this massive invasion and, and the enormous mobilization from Russia it's, it's in itself very telling. I believe that, I mean, for, for Norway, uh, being in Europe, neighbor to Russia, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we see that um, defending uh, Ukraine's right to defend itself is a core principle, I believe, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, but also for the security order in Europe. And, and what we need to do now is really to hear his call, and that is for air defense primarily. That is critically important. And you know, important parts of the air defense now defending the Ukrainian cities comes from Norwegian technology. We produce this, this NASAM battery system, and there's Patriots and others, but we really have to come up and see what, how, what can we do to support them. And then I think, you know, uh, uh, um, we support uh, Ukraine's right to defend itself. At some stage, there has to be uh, moving over to to, to a new phase uh, where we are not um, seeing this as a stalemate on the battlefield. And from my perspective, this has to be uh, uh, Ukraine's call. You know, uh, when are we in a situation where you can move into a, a different phase? There will be a NATO summit. There will be uh, in mid-July in D.C. Uh, there will be a meeting in Switzerland mid-June uh, about, you know, the peace formula, countries coming together. Uh, and um, uh, I think we also have to politically to work on that. Last remark is that, you know, Russia will be there also after this war. Sometimes I, I hear people talk about Europe as, as they are kind of with a pair of scissors taking Russia away from the European map. We have to consider and, and, and conceptualize the European security order in the future that will give security to countries small and large. I know uh, there are large countries such as Russia who would like to go back to spheres of influence, the kind of the old 1945 scenario. That is not Europe for the 21st century. And Europe had the biggest toolbox of resolving conflicts of this order of any continent. And we need to get back to get back to the thinking of how that should be. And I, I'm a bit wary that we are now constantly talking military escalation, and it is necessary, but we also need some of ourselves to discuss, you know, what security order is best for Europe? If you if you go back to World War II, the World War II post World War order was started to be conceptualized, you know, in 1942-43, and we now have to spend also time on, on, on looking how we can avoid this terrible tragedy unfolding in Ukraine to happen elsewhere. That's very interesting. I, I just want to say, I mean, because it, it ties together the two things we've been talking about, right? So you're sitting there and you're thinking as the leader of Norway, which has a kind of additional role in, in, in terms of diplomacy and assistance over the years. It's kind of a one of a, the kind of better behaved stakeholders in the international order. But you're looking at both the situation in Israel and Palestine and in Russia, Ukraine, and, and what kind of ties this together is, is thinking about both how do you weather the storm that we're in, but in both cases, you're talking about, hey, we actually need to start thinking about What's the future of Palestine and Israel? What's the future of Russia and Ukraine? Yeah. And there's one more dimension to this, which I like to highlight, and that is, you know, we travel we travel around in the global south to explain the meaning of this war in Ukraine, you know, trying to call their attention to how serious this is. And then comes Gaza, and then comes the question of do you have double standards? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that is a critical issue. And, it, and you know, for me, uh, you know, you cannot compare these two conflicts because they are too, di too, too, too different. But human lives can be compared. And that is why I think, you know, uh, 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 having, you know, today I've been traveling around uh, uh, Norway, uh, uh, visiting schools and universities just to see what this does to people. You know, the young generation get all these news, 
not by text explanation, but by images coming in on their mobile phones, you know, all kind of social media. And, 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 and they keep asking, you know, is the life a life? Is a murder a murder? Is a disaster a disaster? And, you know, it's not a wall to wall, but, but, but there's a bigger picture where we, I think, uh, who believe we, <laughs> we, we, we belong to the free world and, and these principles, we have to be very wary these days to not to be, you know, uh, fall in the double, double standard basket. Yeah, in some ways, it's more important than ever uh, to to avoid that. Well, look, uh, I I really appreciate you coming on and, and explaining a very consequential week in, in Norwegian foreign policy. Um, and as people heard, uh, you're you're thoughtful always on these issues and and trying to see the big picture. So uh, thanks for for joining us and look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much. Today we have a very exciting co-host, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, journalist, uh, author, and CNN host Fareed Zakaria. Fareed. Uh, so glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. I'm a fan, so this is so much fun for me. People should know, first of all, Fareed, um, uh, you know, probably, you know, perhaps Barack Obama's favorite commentator. Uh, so so uh, part of my job in the White House was uh, not only to talk to you as a journalist, but to make sure that, I, uh, you know, I was uh, getting your commentary in front of the boss so he didn't miss any of it because uh, he always wanted to see it. But you're also the author, author of an extraordinary new book that we're going to talk about in a few minutes called Age of Revolutions. Um, I just can, at the top, let me just congratulate you and encourage everybody to pick this one up. This is really a sweeping look at what's happening now through the prism of uh, revolutions uh, past and history. So really looking forward to talking to you about that. But uh, we're going to dive in with some uh, revolutionary activity that's happening around the world for you, if that's okay with you. That's totally fine. Um, okay, well, let's start with Gaza. It's been a, a busy week, uh, to say the least. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick recap here. Uh, we talked uh, in the last podcast about the ICC requesting arrest warrants for the leaders of Hamas and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Gallant. Um, then since then, uh, we've had some additional uh, steps taken. Spain, Norway, and Ireland uh, went out in a coordinated fashion to say that they would recognize uh, a Palestinian state formally. Fried, we're just going to play a quick clip here from what the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, had to say about this decision on, on your network on CNN. What is happening at the moment in Palestine is unconscionable and is almost unimaginable. And I don't yet think the world comprehends the scale of devastation facing Palestinian civilians. And we cannot turn a blind eye. And I will not allow a scenario where in years to come, People ask me, what did you do at that moment? And people ask Ireland, what did you do at that moment? The answer cannot be that we stayed silent. We must stand up for human rights, stand up against, um, against breaches of international law and call out this humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, and really, there only, the only way you resolve this conflict is through, is through peaceful political dialogue. So uh, this is you know, largely symbolic in the sense that uh, you know, these countries join over 140 countries uh, at the United Nations General Assembly, who've recognized Palestine, um, but at the same time, it doesn't create a Palestinian state, and the U.S. would continue to veto the creation of a Palestinian state uh, through the U.N. Security Council. That said, uh, as, we, as I'm w working my way up to question here, Fareed, but uh, there's so much news to get through, this adds to kind of the momentum, I think, of, of pressure on Israel and pressure on the old paradigm of the peace process. Netanyahu, uh, of course, condemned it, called it a reward for terrorism. But then, uh, just this morning, uh, before we uh, began talking here, the International Court of Justice announced that Israel must halt its military operation in Rafah. Uh, here's how Judge Nawaf Salam, the president of the ICJ, the highest court in the world, explained this move. Israel must immediately halt its military offensive and any other action in the Rafah governorate, which may inflict on the Palestinian group in Gaza conditions of life that could bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. So uh, this is uh, citing immediate risk to civilians in Rafah, and this comes after the ICJ previously kind of warned of the potential for genocide. And you heard him use language about the destruction of the Palestinian people in Gaza in whole or in part. So to summarize here, we've got the ICC issuing arrest warrants for the Prime Minister of Israel. We've got three European nations, which have generally not recognized Palestine in the same percentages as other nations, taking that step this week. And then today we had the ICJ um, issuing this order. Meanwhile, in U.S. politics, you know, the Biden administration condemned the ICC. And then uh, just yesterday, the U.S. Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, announced that Bibi Netanyahu will be invited by him and Chuck Schumer to address a joint session of Congress. So free where I start after all that. 
is just how you make sense of someone as nobody is better than you at following both U.S. politics and global politics. This gap between where the U.S. government is and the U.S. Congress is and the rest of the world, I, I don't even know how to describe it anymore. I mean, how do you put the, in context the different views that we saw this week from Washington versus the rest of the world? No, you're absolutely right. This is one of the areas where the United States is just in a completely different place than almost all of the rest of the world. Some countries in Europe, to be fair, uh, are also uh, very, very different from you know, where Spain is, for example. The Germans have been very stalwart supporters of Israel for obvious historical reasons. The UK has tended to be very supportive. India has tended to be very supportive. And there, you know, so there are unusual cases. Uh, Hungary, bizarrely, is very supportive of, uh, of Bibi Netanyahu. Um, they, they, they don't say, Orban doesn't seem to like uh, most Jews, but he's found one he likes, uh, Bibi yes, Netanyahu. Exactly. But look, I think the best way to think about this is where does this take us? Where does it go? The pressure on Israel is real, even though the Israelis will, will deny it. They don't want to feel like a pariah state. They felt like one of the great things that had happened in Israel over the last 10 years was the increasing normalization of Israel, perhaps because it was seen as a kind of tech superpower, whatever. Um, and that, was, that gave Israelis immense sense of pride. But it is important to think about the reality. Israel has the power on the ground. All this pressure makes no difference if it doesn't move Israel. Because you know the Security Council, uh, Council can't grant a Palestinian state. Only one country in the world can do it, and that is Israel. Israel controls that ground. It is not going to allow a Palestinian state to to happen. But you know, just because somebody in the in the UN uh, uh, passes a resolution, so the American position of hugging I Israel uh, it both expresses certain American values, I suppose. But I would argue just strategically. It is a it is a smart place to be if you can use that that hug to privately pressure uh, 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 the Israeli government. And I would argue the Biden people are actually now doing something very um, th th something that is uh, positive and strategic and has a has a chance of working. I don't want to say more more than that because look, you you can you can always make money betting against the peace in the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian process. But what the Biden people are trying to do is to go to the Saudis, go to the Egyptians, go to the UAE and, and company, but above all, go to the Saudis and say, do you want this deal, a normalization with Israel, diplomatic relations with Israel in return for which the US will give you security guarantees, you get a civilian nuclear program, and Israel has to make the, the concession of a credible and irreversible path to a Palestinian state. The Saudis have basically said yes. So the question is, how do you get the Israelis to recognize that this is a deal of a lifetime? This is what they have always wanted. Normalized relations with Saudi Arabia, the custodian of the two holy mosques, the largest funder of Arab governments. So it, that really would integrate Israel into the region, in, which has always been the dream. And what they have to do is recognize that they need, you know, they need they they need to do something serious and real with the Palestinians. And what they have been doing is reminding uh, Bibi Netanyahu that he is on 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 the record in favor of a Palestinian state. He gave a very famous speech at Bar Ilan, which he gave because you Ben Rhodes <laughs> and your boss Barack Obama essentially pressured him into doing it. But he's now on the record, and so there is. You know, potentially a deal here, and let's let's be cra you know crass political about this. BB needs something like this to get out of the the mess he's in, to restore his credibility, to give the sense that he's a winner and he can get a diplomatic triumph out of it. And if you want a Palestinian state, you need a right wing politician to deliver it. If a left wing politician in Israel proposes or agrees to a Palestinian state, it will not happen because the right wing will tear it apart. So for all those reasons, I realize I'm trying to find the silver lining in a very dark cloud, but I think A, there is one, and B, you've got to give the Biden administration credit on this. People, you know, people have, have pilloried it. I've been tough on them at, at times because I thought they should have been reigning in Israel much earlier and much more, but they are now in a place where they are trying to take this crisis 
and find in it a, an, an opportunity. So I guess as someone who's been a little more uh, skeptical, um, but like you said, it's always easy to bet on skepticism in this. Um, there's the, you know, the, the data points I look at are an Israeli right that actually doesn't see Saudi normalization as the goal. You know, they see, basically, they want all the land. And, and here, I mean, Ben Gavir and Smoltrick, you know, like the, the far right clearly would prefer to control the West Bank and Gaza than to have Saudi normalization in a deal. Um, Netanyahu, uh, you know, has kind of generally, when push comes to shove, broken in that direction. And, and so I guess just the, the follow up I would have is I, 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 I understand that play, but I also feel like. We've done the hug strategy, you know, basically since Oslo, you know, with some friction along the way. And I was a part of some of that friction. Do you see, like, what is the utility of this kind of three dimensional puzzle, right? You've got, because I think there's a role for pressure. And so you've got these, you know, call it bad cops, but like you've got the Europeans saying, we're, you know, we're done with direct negotiations. That leads nowhere. That's how the Israeli government has played for time in the past. We're going to shortcut to rec recognition to, to apply some pressure here. You've got, obviously, the international legal proceedings, which are kind of a different track. Then you've got this kind of Abraham's Accords track from the Gulf. I mean, like, what is the, the manner in which that assembles? Like, wh where, where does the place for pressure versus the place for diplomacy come, particularly when you're dealing with, as you said, an endgame that is inside of Israeli politics, which is, is very hard to control? You know. Yeah, I mean, look. Obviously, the, the, you're you're making a, a, a lot of very smart points. Uh, so, to to be clear, if in order for this to work, Bibi would have to announce that he was in, you know, he was in favor of uh, a, a, a Palestinian state, which would mean he would lose those two uh, extreme right wing uh, members of his coalition, uh, Ben Gavir and Smolich, and they would they would collapse the government as a result. There would be new yeah. elections, and the th Bibi's theory would have to be he would now be able to form a more centrist coalition, which, to be fair, was how he's always governed. This is the exception over the last 20 yeah. years. This, so this would take him back to more of a kind of li liquid and center-right uh, coalition. Th they would win the election because he was promising you know, Saudi normalization and things like that. Uh, of course, it could not happen. But on the other hand, if it doesn't happen and another center-right politician, and I know that Naftali Bennett thinks that this is a perfect opportunity for him, might step in and do something like that, maybe even, you know, Gallant or something like that. So it's a, it's a tough one. But your, your larger question is, is a very good one, which is, could American pressure work better? Look, American pressure could work if you were able to convince the Israelis that this did not present an existential threat to them. Israel has lived I, 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 under a kind of garrison fortress mentality for much of its existence. It has not worried about uh, external pressure. From 48 to 73, the United States was not particularly supportive of Israel. 67 is really the shift with the Johnson administration. So they've, they've been alone and they felt fine. We're going to, you know, well, so I'm not sure it would be as effective as people do. But the other piece of it is in order for it to be effective, we have to talk about the reality of politics in America, too, which is no president can do this in a context in which this is a deeply partisan issue, and he's going to get outflanked. And the best example of this was Obama with, you know, with the Iran nuclear deal. The, Bibi was determined to scuttle the deal. Obama was basically putting a lot of pressure. You correct me if I'm wrong about this. And Bibi does an end run where he gets the Republicans to invite him and give a joint session of Congress and essentially undermines everything Obama's doing as a result of which the Iran nuclear deal ends up being an executive agreement, which, you know, which then Trump can pull out, which was, a, I mean, the whole thing was a disaster because the Iran nuclear deal was, you know, a very effective uh, diplomatic triumph in many ways where you got Iran. There's a, there's a part of the uh, one of uh, BB's speeches that I was reading, because you know I, I wrote a little bit about this, where he says the reason you should uh, have sanctions on Iran, the reason you should keep uh, Iran in a box is because they've they've never agreed to destroy their uh, their enrichers, their enrichment facilities. If they yeah. do, we should. Re and of course, you guys got them to go down to basically three percent. It was a total destruction yeah. of and their destroy so, their plutonium reactor and destroy yeah. their plutonium. Yeah. Yeah. Literally yeah. put cement uh, yeah. over it. So. Even though it was a very well-crafted strategy, 
the pressure didn't work because the Republicans created an escape valve. And if you do, if that's the reality, we can we can bemoan it, but you're not going to be able to use effective pressure. Yeah. Well, it, it all would have worked if uh, Donald Trump didn't get elected in 2016. That's yeah, American politics. It's not just Israeli politics, right? It's American politics. And by yeah. the way, that had a follow-on effect on in Iran. Exactly. Which yeah. is, you know, I don't want to exaggerate the degree to which there are reformers and and hardliners in Iran. It's a hardline theocracy. But there are there was a spectrum. And yeah. the people who wanted a more more integration and less uh, of a kind of aggressive foreign policy were totally discredited once Trump pulled out of the deal. Because and and the hardliners who had always been against the Iran nuclear deal are now totally triumphant and totally in control in Iran. So the whole thing has been a disaster. But it was precisely because we had this partisan division in the United States. Yeah. Well, it foreshadows. Like what we'll talk about a little bit later with your book, because I mean, it's also how hardline politics in different places kind of reinforces each other, um, which you know brings us to to the uh, the high priest of hardline politics in the world today, Vladimir Putin, uh, and the war in Ukraine. Um, so it's not been trending well, Freed, uh, as you've been covering. Uh, Russia has continued its military advance on Kharkiv, uh, making pretty steady, if incremental, gains. Uh, I think Zelensky has been out. Asking, you know, with increasing urgency um, for, you know, permission to use uh, weapons that he's been provided on Russian soil um, for help in shooting things down. Um, there's some debate after Tony Blinken's recent trip to Ukraine within the Biden administration about how far to go with that. I, I wanted to ask you, as someone who, like me, I think, you know, you've been uh, you know, incredibly sympathetic to and supportive of the Ukrainians and also probably a bit worried about, you know, Russia's not going anywhere, you know. So the idea of like a total military defeat of Russia has always seemed kind of a bit fanciful, and I think some people got a little too, um, you know, uh, predictive of that and hyperbolic in, in the belief that you could completely dislodge Russia from, say, Crimea. What do you make of this balance between? Um, does it help to reach a better negotiated settlement to kind of open up? The aperture, let the Ukrainians take some more shots in Russia, give them some more advanced weapons. How do you balance that against the kind of inevitability that there's going to have to be some negotiating at some point? Is, is, how do you see that? I mean, to continue the theme of kind of three dimensional, uh, impossible puzzles to assemble, you, you know, Ukraine is asking for those material uh, and, and that, that permission at the same time that they're preparing for a peace summit in Switzerland in mid June, which is mainly about validating their own kind of terms for a peace negotiation. Russia's not at that um, summit. How do you see the mix of military support and diplomacy in the context of what the best outcome could be for Ukraine? Yeah, this is a really tough one. And I think it shows you how you know people can, can criticize from the outside, but it's complicated, right? So if, if you were to just say, let the Ukrainians have everything they want, let them strike deep into Russia, uh, you know, shoot down Russian stuff that's that's uh, that's over Ukrainian airspace willy nilly. Putin has made it clear he would respond. Now he is threatening to respond with tactical nuclear weapons, even if that's not true. You know, Russia is a great power; it has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. It has a veto in the, the Security Council. It has uh, troops spread all over. Uh, you know, it has equities in the Middle East. So it it, it is something to be careful about. The, you know, the West does not want to go to war with Russia directly. This is something we tried to avoid throughout the Cold War for good reason, because, you, you know, basically the danger in a situation like that is if you get into a direct confrontation, neither side can back down. You know, this is the classic doom, uh, doom loop of security spiral you get into. And if each side feels they can't back down, you inevitably get to a point well, you are actually engaged in a major war with another nuclear power. And that could take you up an escalation ladder that you don't want to go. So that's the fear. All that said, I think the Biden people are probably being too cautious. I think that there is more they could allow the Ukrainians to do, particularly give them weaponry that allows them to do it. I also think maybe there's a way to do something that's kind of uh, a, you know, a bit of a wink-wink saying, we have told the Ukrainians that they can't, you know, they can't fire into Russian uh, 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 territory. We believe they're adhering to that. You know, the Ukrainians, they, they, no, no, there's no, nobody's checking on them every day. Nobody's giving them, you know, vetoes. If the Ukrainians are firing occasionally, 
uh, you know, missiles a little bit further, it's the fog of war. That, I mean, I wonder whether there's some piece of that. The 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 air defenses part, I'm much more sympathetic to the Ukrainians. Yeah. Why couldn't you set up an air defense? We saw how how well it worked in in the case of Israel. And by the way, that one worked in Israel largely because of the United States, not because of the Iron Dome. My understanding is we shot down 50% of the 300 Iranian missiles, drones, cruise missiles that came over. Why couldn't we do something like that? For example, you know, make Kyiv impregnable, make Kharkiv impregnable, you know, yeah. and things like that. So I do think, look, at some level, Macron is right when he says, are, are we in this to win? If we're in this to win, why are we tying our one hand behind the, our backs? Uh, you know, we need to be clear that we will do what it takes to win. And we shouldn't be signaling in advance that we're not doing, uh, you know, we're not, we're taking this off the table, we're taking that off the table. Uh, I, 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 I think that if we took the, a, a more aggressive strategy, if we allowed the Ukrainians to take a more aggressive strategy, we probably would get some victories. But I do agree with your basic point at the end, which is this is going to end in a negotiation. It is going to end in a negotiation which has a settlement that looks roughly like where we are now. In other words, the Russians have taken about 18% of Ukraine. They, they took more than, they, than the Ukrainians took back some. I think it's somewhere in the 18 to 20% that the Ukrainians have lost. I don't think they're getting that back. The, the question is, can you get to the point where the two parties are willing to accept that reality? I don't think they will ever accept the legitimacy of it. The Ukrainians will never recognize that as Russian. The Russians will probably want more. You know, there's historic Russia is actually another t 10 percent of Ukraine. The Russians are not going to get. And so the question is, at what point does it feel like you can get to the negotiating table and have a serious conversation about this, or even an armistice like the Korean War, which is which may yeah. be how this ends. You know, the Korean War is not technically over. They just stop fighting. That's why it's called a DMZ, a de demilitarized zone. And maybe that's how this ends. But that the the, the conf, you know the the key I think is for us to convince the Ukrainians. Look, the your goal should be a free, sovereign, democratic Ukraine anchored in the West. The particular size of that Ukraine, don't get hung up on. And somebody has to convince the Russians. Look, you know you 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 have you have become a total pariah. You have been denied access to all this technology. You've been your, you know, your economy is 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 in a very, very difficult state. There's a way out. Um, and I wish we had better relations with the Chinese because that would be a, a very one very powerful way to go. But if you could get both of those things to happen by probably next year, the problem is the Russians are waiting for Trump. And they're waiting for Trump and they think Trump is going to surrender for the Ukrainians and cut a deal. And so none of this is going to happen till next year. Yeah, I, look, I think that's very well said. Uh, I mean, at the price of, uh, you know, of losing Crimea and parts of uh, eastern Ukraine are, you know, full membership in, in the West, essentially. Um, you know, exactly. I, I think that's a better, you know, it's, it's obviously not what Ukrainians would want. And I wouldn't expect them to want that. And it's tragic to, for the Ukrainians that uh, are on the other side of that iron curtain. But I mean, your, your Korea you know, example is a good one in the sense that that turned out pretty well for South Korea, um, and, and and that kind of leads me. You, know, you mentioned China to the, the 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 last piece of this World War Three puzzle that we're trying to avoid. And one of the things I've thought about, Breed, is is how much these are the fault lines of unresolved history, which which we'll get to in your book. In the sense that Ukraine is just beyond the NATO umbrella, Taiwan unresolved piece of history from uh, uh, obviously the end of the Chinese Revolution, um, Israel just beyond treaty obligation, right? Um, so we're kind of all on these fault lines where, you know, Russia, China, Iran kind of run into the U.S. and its allies. Taiwan is obviously at the forefront of that. And the one piece of this, it is not an active conflict yet. Um, they recently inaugurated a new president, William Lai, um, on May 20th, which predictably heated things up. Uh, I'm going to play a short clip here translated from uh, William Lai's inauguration speech. I want to call on China to cease their political and military intimidation against Taiwan, share the global responsibility of maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait as well as the greater region, and ensure the world is free from the fear of war. So carefully formulated language there, as these things always are out of Taiwan. Uh, China, 
I think inevitably was going to respond to something. Um, and they described some military exercises that they did kind of flexing their muscles around Taiwan as, quote, strong punishment for the separatist acts of Taiwan independence. Um, William Lai in the past has been more uh, forward leaning and supporting independence. He's moderated uh, as part of his campaign. Now William Lai is touring military bases in Taiwan. He's talked about kind of a peace through strength approach. He's put their military on alert. Um, what, what, what is the best way for Reed to, in continuing our theme of, 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 <laughs> of trying to, to balance the need to stand with you know, a Democratic partner, um, but also to avoid a war that would not be good for that Democratic partner as well as everybody else? How are you looking at Taiwan right now? And, and how do you see the U.S. in particular as, as uh, the balance it needs to strike between supporting Taiwan, deterring China, but not necessarily provoking China by, you know, upping the ante in the kind of arms we provide or security guarantees we provide to Taiwan. First, I want to underscore something you said that I thought was so well well put, which I hadn't thought about exactly in that same way, which is that you have these three historically unresolved areas, as it were, a kind of almost like a, the, the detritus of history. And, you know, you're having a, a challenge to American, to the American order and to American uh, hegemony or Western hegemony or the liberal international order, call, call it what you will. But they have found these weak spots precisely because they are historically unresolved. If you think about it, you know, the status of Ukraine is unresolved because it was not just part of the Soviet Union, but part of the Tsarist Empire. So it's 300 years old. The, 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 the occupied territories in, in the you know, West Bank and Gaza, 56 years unresolved. And of course, Taiwan unresolved since 1949. Um, and so, you know, those are the, the, you know, so you have tension and you have problems, you have, but, but these become the, uh, the tripwires that could actually lead you to, to conflict. Uh, with regard to Taiwan, the thing I worry about is this. Um, the Chinese always had a strategy towards Taiwan, which was that time was on their side. I think Deng Xiaoping once said to Kissinger, Look, at the end of the day, you know, we're 1.4 billion people on one side of the Taiwan Straits, and there are 22 million people. We're going to be the largest economy in the world. Inevitably, the, the magnetic attraction is going to pull them toward us. So some words to that effect. And I think that really was the Chinese strategy. Kick the can down the road, because at the end of the day, these ties will keep building and what's happened, and this is partly because of what things that have happened in Taiwan, but partly Xi Jinping, yeah, very much more repressive uh, ruler, much more anti-democratic, shut down the promises he made in Hong Kong and democracy in Hong Kong. And so the Taiwanese look at all of that, and they are becoming much more independence-minded. So what a, a Xi Jinping correctly is realizing is that maybe time is not on his side that Taiwan is becoming every day, every month, every year more independence-minded, more proud of its democratic character. And so, in a very real way, does he have a window of opportunity to act now rather than 10 years from now? So, to my mind, American strategy has to be a, a kind of deterrence strategy that is not provocative, but that very slightly, in the way that the Chinese keep trying to do a little bit of the salami tactics of adding you know, more flights, more harassment, very slightly, you just keep building up the deterrent capacity. You just keep building up the deterrent capacity. And I think, again, to give credit to Biden, what he's done is he's taken our policy, which was, it has famously been described as strategic ambiguity about whether we would defend Taiwan. And the way I would call it is this, it's a strategic ambiguity, but a little less ambiguous. So that four, four times on the record when he is asked, will the United States defend Taiwan? He says, yes. Well, he was once asked, wait, you're saying American troops would go in and defend Taiwan? And he says, yes. The next day, the press asks Jake Sullivan, has American policy toward China, uh, Taiwan changed? And he says, oh, no. We have the same policy. It's strategic ambiguity. Now, you know, you try to figure out that that puzzle. But what I think they're doing is they're saying we're shading strategic ambiguity so it's a little less ambiguous. Should they do more? I think it's a very careful game because this is a neuralgic is issue for China. And it's this is not a Xi Jinping issue. Most people don't realize. 
the Taiwan issue, every Chinese leader has believed. It's in the, it's in the constitution of the People's yeah. Republic of China that Taiwan will be unified. It is, as you put it, the, the leftover part of the, of the communist revolution that took over. It's the one piece they weren't able to take over. And so I would be, I, I, I would be careful. I would also try to work on more broadly having better working relations with China. You know, in a way that allows you again to build that deterrent a little bit, but signaling to the Ch the Chinese at the same time: Look, we are never going to provoke anything. We're never going to uh, recognize Taiwan independence. And you know, I think Jake Sullivan put it very well. He said the Taiwan situation. I, I think this is on my show that it's 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 always been illogical and contradictory. But all that weird and illogic and contradictory stuff has held peace for you know since 1949. Let's just try, and particularly since the Shanghai communique, let's just try to keep it going. You know, sometimes you can't solve these problems. Let's just keep the peace. Oh, yeah. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, on this one, I think we're very aligned. I, uh, uh, in solving the problem isn't the goal here. It's avoiding uh, the status yeah, quo, exactly. as weird right. as it is, is great, you know. And um, I think in addition, I think they've been good at not just the messaging, but, you know, the, the, the slight turn in the weapons provided, instead of just giving them big you know, showy weapons that are kind of useless in a contingency, right? Like new ships or new planes, giving them the things that they actually need to defend themselves, right? You know, anti-tank weapons, anti-ship weapons, um, smaller arms, frankly, the stuff that the Ukrainians have used. The so-called porcupine strategy, which I think is exactly right. Yeah. yeah you know, it's, so it's actual deterrence and not just kind of a arm sales for the sake of arm sales. Um, well, look, I, this history turn... Uh, that we took uh, is a great way of, of working into your book here. And as someone who you know wrote on on the subject of the rise of of kind of uh, populist autocracy, I think one thing's been missing from a lot of the writing about this and commentary about this um, rise of populism and ethno nationalism and autocracy is the historical context. Um, and and this is one of the things that this your new book does so incredibly well. So you take this kind of sweeping look at past revolutions. Particularly, you know, things like the Dutch, and British, and French, uh, the Industrial Revolutions here and in the UK, uh, and then you kind of juxtapose that with whatever's been going on uh, in in kind of the post Cold War uh, period. Um, as people who follow your commentary, uh, you know, what what I I like about your worldview for read, and I I've tried to emulate as best I can, is that you work in not just politics, but um, the economy, the technological change, issues around identity. And so you kind of paint this picture, and I wanted to just start by asking you, um, kind of what motivated you to write this book, to take this entry point? I mean, presumably you wanted to talk about the revolutions and the populism that is remaking our world today and contributed to everything we just talked about. Um, you chose to kind of enter through the doorway of these kind of mainly European revolutions of the past. Um, what, what, what drew you to that idea? And what was it like to kind of step out of the present and look at the present from that uh, prism of past revolution. Yeah, I mean that's a great question. In some ways, the, the the broadest at the broadest possible level, Ben. I think you and I were motivated by very similar things. I, I read your last book and loved it. And what you were really talking about was, look, the world seemed to be going a certain direction after 1989, and it was a a, a direction that uh, for people who believed in you know the Enlightenment liberal project of the Western world and the way it was being universalized with human rights and democracy and uh, freer markets, freer trade, freer information, this seemed like a wonderful thing, and it seemed like you know human aspirations were being fulfilled. And then something happened, and it's you know it's gone it's it's gone haywire, or it's got at least gotten much more complicated. And there's you know there's a big backlash. What is going on? So, so at the meta level, it was that. I began thinking about it um, about 10 years ago with the rise of the Tea Party, because I noticed yeah. something very bizarre. You know, the Republican Party tends to be a very hierarchical party, very top down. You know, there's that famous line about presidential nominations that Democrats have to fall in love. You know, you think about Clinton, uh, Obama, Kennedy. But Republicans fall in line, right? They nominate the guy, the next guy on the uh, uh, in the on the list. Uh, you know, Bob Dole, uh, John McCain. Uh, I mean, this is the party that nominated Richard Nixon five times for its yeah, yeah, presidential yeah. vice presidential ticket. So uh, that party was being upended by an insurgency, and the insurgency was very unusual in that 
it was not it was not really Reagan's uh, Republican Party. It wasn't about free trade and you know spreading democracy abroad and limited government. It was mostly about cultural issues. The you know Theda Scotch at Yale has this wonderful book about the Tea Party. She spent a year basically hanging out with them, and she says all their motivations were cultural. It was immigration. It was what we would now call the woke agenda, multiculturalism. A lot of it was, you know, the 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 backlash of the first black family As in the a, White House. A black president, yeah. 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 And, and, and it's absolutely clear. That's why they, even today, Ben, I think there's something like 30% of the Republican Party says we don't believe Obama was born in America. I mean, there's still, you know, which is, yeah. I, I always have taken a way of expressing a kind of visceral cultural uh, objection to you know, to 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 the rise of of you know blacks or Obama, or however you want to put it, it's a kind of it's a kind of you know opposition to to all this diversity multiculturalism that's that's sweeping through American society. So you know, when I started to think about it in, in in terms of that kind of a backlash, I asked myself, well, we've had periods of great change before these great revolutions which have moved societies forward. What did the backlash look like, and why will you know? How did it work? And I was fascinated when I would go back to find that even with the Dutch, you know, who were the, really the beginning of, of modern politics, they the enormous technological uh, uh, progress, enormous economic uh, revolution, uh, and it produces an identity revolution. They start to think of themselves as Dutch, as Protestant, not as part of the Catholic Habsburg Empire. And there's a backlash. There is a there is there develops a party that says this is way too much change, too much, too fast. Let's go back to the old ways. Let you know we'll take you back to a simpler age. There was almost like yeah. there was a party that said we'll make the Netherlands great again, which yeah. which has always been the, the 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 politics of nostalgia. You know, it's is, the oldest it, form of politics out there. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's and it turns out it's very and and it gets heightened when you have a lot of. A pro progressive change. But what's interesting to me about that, that you seem to kind of be particularly drawn by the, the Dutch uh, revolution, but then also how it be, you know, the, fed into the glorious revolution in, in, in England with William of Orange. Um, it, it seemed to me, um, you know, part of what you admired about how that was kind of managed, unlike, say, the French Revolution, where they, you know, burned it all down and then Napoleon <laughs> rampaged across Europe, right? Is that... Um, there was this kind of bottom up you know demand for change but it kind of was captured by reform of political institutions right so you know it's kind of what we would think of as a more conservative revolution um so it was like a, a, a an incremental embrace of pluralism reform I, I mean right now it seems like we're caught in between a kind of burn it down right wing nationalism and a um, a far like a left wing that hasn't kind of figured out how to win the populist fight, <laughs> and then like social democrats who are in this kind of very strange place of like defending institutions that they used to criticize, you know, like yeah, like yeah. Uh, the CIA and the you know the military industrial complex is now. I, I, I mean, what did you take from that? Because I, I could feel your affinity for kind of the 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 William of Orange character, and um, what can we learn about a different model of revolution than MAGA or, you know, communism, essentially? Yeah. I mean, you, you look, you're asking the central question is how do you navigate through this these kind of rep periods yeah. of revolution? And it feels like the ones that have done it the best, and by best, I mean the ones who've been able to do it in a way where the change, the progressive change that we all want endures are the ones who have tended to be incremental. The ones who have recognized that, you know, Societies can only take so much change so fast, who've been willing to take a half loaf or even a quarter loaf rather than the full loaf. And I think that for people, you know, who generally are in, of that inclination, my, my feeling is always just, you know, be understanding. Like, take, for example, immigration. As an immigrant, the U.S. in 1975 was 4.5% four, four foreign-born. It's today 15% foreign-born. Look, I think that's a wonderful thing. It's it's enriched America in a hundred different ways, but it's a lot of change, you know, for particularly for people who have lived in a very monocultural uh, uh, kind of atmosphere in a town or community. So just 
be understanding be you know try to try to persuade don't shame people don't make it feel like they're somehow morally inferior if they don't understand what you what you understand I mean, similarly on some of these gender issues you know i mean I, I look i think people like clinton and obama practice that politics you know people i know that it's now very unpopular to to say or you know it's a sign of supposedly obama's kind of retrograde uh, politics that he initially was in favor of civil unions but not gay marriage but that's a perfect example of a politician trying to make sure he's not too far ahead of the of 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 his country he's not too far you know there was a wonderful line that franklin roosevelt has where he says there is a, there is, is a, a terrible thing to be a leader and to turn around and to notice that there is no one following you you know you can only lead if you have if you figured out the, the positions that you have that have enough of a following that it will then lead to enduring change and i think on the left there tends to be a sometimes a search for purity and an impatience with that process and i would just say look the goal here is to make these changes endure not to, not to get a momentary victory yeah there was another great roosevelt line um that obama used to quote to me all the time about this the interplay between politicians and public opinion where he was meeting with with randolph the the, the great head of the black porters union who ended up being the leader of the march on washington in 1963 and and randolph had a bunch of demands for fdr and he said i agree with all those demands now go make me do it you know yeah. Yeah. Um, and he did yeah. actually he pressured him to make some big changes well, I, I want to make sure I also ask you, though, Freed, in the in the second half of the book where you're dealing with, you know, it's a great survey of the changes that are happening now um, in the economy, in technology, um, in, in, in identity politics. Um, but you also obviously given your perspective and, and for this audience, uh, you, you know, geopolitics is a part of this. And part of what's so unsettling to me, frankly, and, and interesting in reading your book and how you kind of weave these threads together is, we are somehow simultaneously in this country going to have to figure out how to not lose our democracy and how to not end up in World War Three, you know, and, and it, like those are somehow related, um, but they're also somewhat distinct. And this kind of comes back a bit to the China piece. But one of the things that worries me is that um, the and you interview a lot of people on your show, right, who including Democrats and including people who I might agree with on, on almost the, all the indiv a lot of the individual issues, but it's kind of a mindset of American primacy, you know, and in your head of the curve on anticipating a multipolar world. Look, I, you know, I don't like a lot of the things Xi Jinping does, but you know, you argue in the book for kind of a finding a way of coexistence with China and finding ways to form kind of, you know, obviously partnerships of shared interests around things like climate change and technology that we're going to have to do. How do you, coming out of this process, how did you look at the ways in which we can reconcile both the need to manage the revolutions in our own society with the need to kind of coexist with a different system like China in the world? You know, it, I, I came out of, uh, in doing the research for this, I, I came out of it a little more pessimistic on that front. I, I, you you uh, and I shared the perspective entirely on on where we'd like to see the kind of sweet spot of American uh, foreign policy, which is, you know, find a way to cooperate with China where you can. Of course, there's going to be a lot of competition. Of course, there's going to be a lot of tension. But, you know, let's try to not have a situation where the two largest economies in the world are, you know, are, are moving in, a, in, a, in just one direction, which is toward greater and greater tension. Because particularly given Taiwan, that, that could easily lead to a great power war that we've avoided for 75 years. Um, the trouble is, what I discovered is that for Xi Jinping and Putin, uh, it's not just that they are balancing against American power in a simple, cold, calculated, rational way. They are also balancing against American liberal ideas. It, you know, Xi is very much a cultural conservative. He believes that you know, the greatest danger to the Chinese Communist Party is to be infected by all these Western, for China to be infected by all these Western ideas about openness and, and you know, individual rights and individual autonomy. And so he has been launching a campaign of basically saying, you know, we don't want this. We are a different society. Putin, of course, has done it even more dramatically with the embrace of the Orthodox Church and 
you know, denouncing uh, gender rights in the U.S. But what I came to realize is that these guys are not just balancing against American hard power. They're balancing against American soft power. So they also want, in, in, in an odd way, for their domestic politics, this idea of oppositionalism toward America is, is part of their domestic ideology. It's part of what gives them a certain kind of domestic credibility. So it, it, which all of which means it's a little more difficult to get to, you know, kind of moments of cooperation, arenas of cooperation. So I've come, I've come to a kind of view that is a, a little bit less hopeful, which is, we look, we are not going to, you know, we we, we, are, we are at best going to have a cold peace with with China. It's it's you know what we have to avoid is a hot war and a cold war. And the reason we want to avoid a hot war is obvious, but the reason we want to avoid a cold war is because we, it would so distort an, uh, our, our society. It would mean America would be consumed with this. It would mean an arms race with the second richest country in the world, a country of great technological sophistication. It would mean that we would end up you know, diverting so much of the energy and attention we need to build America back, build the economy invest in our society, build and maintain our democracy, everything would go away and we'd be, all, we'd be, for, and do we really want that? And so is there a path? And there is a path. It's a, it's a working relationship with an adversary. It probably resembles detente with the Soviet Union. You know, we were in a period of intense geopolitical rivalry with the Soviet Union, but we found a way to talk to them. We found a way to stabilize things. We found a way to make sure that there were channels of communication open so that nothing happened that was a misunderstanding, nothing happened that was kind of, you know, like some kind of accidental crisis that then just exploded. Well, look, Frida, I uh, uh, I really appreciate you coming on today. I, people should, uh, people listening should definitely pick up Revolutions. Uh, I mean, we've scratched the surface of such a rich, uh, researched and, and obviously elegantly written book. Um, uh, and I share your, you know, uh, like you, you and I I've, have been trying to find that sweet spot for for, for the, the entire time I've known you. And um, it's it's hard not to be pessimistic, but uh, we've gotten through some tough times before. Hopefully we can do it again. But I, I like how you have evolved your own thinking by examining the kind of politics of countries and not just seeing foreign policy as, you know, a, a, a collection of uh, foreign interests. It's an extension of domestic politics, right, for all these places. So thanks so much for coming on and, and thanks for writing the book. It's a huge pleasure to do this with you, Ben. A uh, longtime admirer of everything you write and, and of this podcast. So thanks for having me. I'm very pleased to welcome to Pod Save the World the founder and CEO of Branch Media, which has uh, got a lot of great podcasts. You should check out The Lost Debate. But we are here to talk about Killing Justice, uh, which Branch did with Cricket Media. I've been very proud to be an executive producer, which, you know, I didn't do much work on this one, Ravi, but uh, it's really turned out great. It's an extraordinary podcast. So congratulations and thanks for coming on. Well, thank you. And, you know, you did the most important thing, which was to land us with Crooked and <laughs> yeah, we're really yeah, excited yeah. to partner, you know, um, and to get this story out there because it's it couldn't come at a better time. Well, yeah, let's start there. I mean, we're, I want to start with the podcast and then get into Indian politics. Um, just it, it's kind of interesting how this is all begins with you, uh, this whole idea for this podcast. And really this whole journey of you as an Indian American who had not really dove into uh, the politics and identity of India, T tell our listeners how this idea came to you, what the origin story of this podcast is, the murder that got your attention. Yeah. So I run this this nonprofit media company called The Branch, and uh, we're small and we kind of we only take on a few projects a year. And a couple of years ago, I got an email and like I imagine you get these kinds of pitches all the time. I always get these emails saying, you know, let's do this podcast together. Let's do this project. And I and I usually ignore them, not because I, I want to be rude, just because you just don't have enough time to vet all these things. But one email I got that really caught my attention was basically making some pretty grand claims about this death of a judge in India that they said was really suspicious and that landed at the doorstep of Modi and his right-hand man, a guy named Amit Shah, who's the current home minister and many people speculate potential successor to Modi, basically saying these guys are potentially implicated in the death of this judge. And I was like, whoa, that's serious. So – I started vetting it and uh, it it was kind of an unlikely project because although my name is Ravi Gupta, I was raised by my mom who's Polish-American in India, my dad who's Indian. 
uh, left us when I was a kid. And so I, I wound up tackling this project both to try to get to the bottom of the story of what happened to this judge, um, but also as an excuse to go to India for the first time and explore this part of my identity. I have a fully Indian name and I have 50% of my DNA from India, but no – lot less about the country than I should. And so that has been the journey I've been on for the past year. Well, I mean, that makes you in a way the kind of perfect guide, right? For people uh, who are kind of just coming to this like you are. One of the things I love about the podcast, which again, everybody should check out Killing Justice, is you kind of set out to answer this question of what happened with the potential murder of this judge. And is there a connection to Amit Shah? And, and, and we'll get into Amit Shah a little bit, but it, it, for people... Just think of Amit Shah as if you combined, you know, Steve Bannon, Stephen Miller, and Mitch McConnell all into one guy. I mean, this is really Modi's right hand man almost barely begins to describe it. Um, so this is a huge allegation. Uh, and you've got an investigative journalists and people listening to this podcast know that it's hard to be an investigative journalist in India these days. And what's interesting to me about it is you go to find the answer to that question. And it leads, like all good reporting, to just more and more questions. And it's, it's hard to get people to talk kind of on the record about what happened, which kind of tells its own story. Um, but as you're going on this journey, you're learning about yourself. You're learning about Indian identity. You're learning about Indian politics. Um, how did the project change in the course of you reporting it and, and traveling to India and following up with sources? Yeah, it, it, it's really fascinating because uh, there's the personal side of things. So from the moment I get off the airplane in Mumbai, People are correcting me on on the way I'm pronouncing my own name, right? So from the beginning, it is it is just a jarring experience. And if you've ever been to Mumbai, I imagine you might have. It is outside of my personal experience. Mumbai is like like nothing I've ever seen. It's not I grew like up any in New other York. place on earth. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Um, so all the personal stuff, which we can get to, is it was incredibly rewarding. Uh, but then on the 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 question of this mystery, there's two parts of it. There's like the actual threads of what happened to this judge. And I learned a lot more that it wasn't just about uh, this particular case that this judge was hearing, which was basically Amit Shah, who's the current home minister, was accused of murder. Uh, it, it went all the way back to the Gujarat riots in 2002, where the guy that was uh, uh, allegedly murdered was also alleged to be uh, – central to the riot story, which I learned throughout the course of this reporting, which actually I, th I thought this was an interesting story to begin with. But then I realized, oh, why is this a case that civil society in India is so up in arms about? Oh, because it potentially leads all the way back to the most inconvenient thing about Modi that exists, right? So that that is that in and of itself was interesting. But then I think at the end of it, right, the show is called Killing Justice, right? We were trying to find out what happened to this judge. Uh, but I think really... It has a, a double meaning as the show goes on because it's really about the death of justice period in India, right? People waiting a decade to get a trial. People who can't, the, you know, reporters who can't report simple stories without threat of harassment and jail time. You know, opposition leaders being jailed. Like, you know, as we speak right now, the one of the leading opposition figures who's the uh, chief minister of Delhi was just arrested not too long ago and basically is having to campaign uh, going back and forth to jail. <laughs> like these are the types of things that should happen in Russia, not India, the world's alleged largest democracy. And so much of the story uh, kind of leads us there too, right? We we really spend a lot of time with what happened to this judge, but we also spend a lot of time saying, well, what happened to India? You know, is this even a democracy anymore? Yeah. I mean, what's so interesting to me in listening to it is that, uh, y you know, there's multiple kind of overlapping potential crimes um and one leads to the other so many yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy it's, it's how many crimes right and, yeah. and, and you know and 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 you can't like be, there's so much effort to just obstruct any effort to get to the truth and this is the killing justice title that it's like there's the one thing that's clear it's kind of a true crime podcast where um you keep bumping into the obstruction <laughs> crime right but you just get the sense that there's this iceberg and these crimes are like the, the piece of the iceberg that is sticking up above the water. And underneath it is this whole rise of Hindu nationalism and the Gujarat riots, you know, which killed over a thousand Muslims uh, when Modi was governor of, of Gujarat is kind of like an origin, not an origin story, actually, but it's a, uh, an accelerant, I guess, to the rise of, of Hindu nationalism is there. 
I, I really like how you brought in history too, because it's it, you bring in the history of the BJP, that's the International Political Party, and the RSS, which is the kind of you know, let's face it, fascist um, aligned kind of civil society organization that led into the BJP. Yeah, that's my favorite episode we did is episode three. Yeah, episode yeah. three is really good. I, I I listened to it the other day, and I mean, what did you learn? I mean, you know, like you said, you you would not delve deep into your your Indian or, or Hindu identity. Um, what did you learn as a kind of layperson uh, about, you know, because people think Hindu, they, they probably don't associate Hinduism with kind of violence. And yes, what did you learn about this? The RSS, the BJP, the forces that created Modi and Amit Shah? Well, I think about it from the perspective of, you know, the RSS is a perfect example. So the RSS is an organization that nobody, like, if you don't know what it is listening, it, it's going to sound bizarre because it is, I think it is the most underappreciated organization in the world. It has thousands and thousands of chapters. They have these things called shakas, which happen every evening and every morning. Um, and it is a, it's like as if you took the uh, Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, the Boy Scouts, and the Republican Party, and then maybe the Evangelical Church, and put them all together into one organizing organization, and actually made it a paramilitary organization that trains people on how to use weapons, but also teaches them uh, to connect with their religion. It is an incredibly powerful organization, and a lot of people get the, the sort of relationship between the RSS and the BJP, which is Modi's party, flipped. They think that the RSS is some kind of subsidiary to the BJP, whereas the RSS is the organization. The BJP is subsidiary to it for the most part. That might be changing recently, but by and large, that's how it goes. A member of the RSS allegedly assassinated Gandhi. So this thing goes all the way back to the origins of the country. And you would think based on that history, right, that, okay, this is an organization that would be a pariah given what we know about Gandhi and how central it is to the country. But Modi is a not only a former member or a current member, because you know it's one of those things that you basically once a member, always a member. He was a member of the RSS, but he was also an organizer of the RSS. So he was actually like a very central figure in the RSS, as was Ahmed Shah. So this is an organization that is at the heart of the story. And so much of what we were trying to figure out in this story was, uh, is a conspiracy possible? Right. I was thinking about Navalny a lot when we were doing this. And this is before Navalny died. But about how Navalny would also always talk about like – Basically, the, the conspiracists don't have to be as competent as you think they are, right? He has a, there's a really good part of his documentary where he kind of talks about how incompetent they could actually be. And they also could be everywhere. Uh, and that actually doesn't make you sound crazy to say that there's like the possibility of a sweeping conspiracy. And so many roads le led back to this RSS organization. And they gave me tons of access, which was actually pretty wild about the story. They basically opened the doors to me. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when you're, you're feeling confident, I guess, uh, you know, um, you, you tell your story. It was the confidence, but also my name. You talked about like why I was yeah. the perfect guide. It's like they heard this name, Ravi Gupta, Hin like a very Hindu name. Uh, and they're obsessed with caste, even though they pretend they're not. And my caste is like the like a merchant class. It's kind of like a middle caste. You're number and I guess three, that right? Means yeah. Something that, yeah. Yeah, that means something to them. Yeah. You know, I didn't I didn't know any of this, by the way. Like they're telling me this, you know, as I'm going through India. So what's interesting is, you know, you and I know each other from Obama days, um, kept in touch. So I, obviously you've been involved in the rise in observing the rise of the right wing or far right here in the US with Trump, well, Tea Party, Trump, MAGA. Um, there are obvious parallels and then there are obvious differences between Trump and the kind of white nationalist uh, make America great again movement here and the, uh, you know, Hindu nationalist, you know, make India great again or Hindu again um, uh, in, in India in, in the sense that there, there are authoritarian tendencies in it um, and there's a lot of otherization of political opponents. What did you find to be the similarities and differences between Trump and Modi and the BJP and the Republican Party? Yeah, and and actually to, that on that RSS point is related. It's that I understand why the organization has power, and this gets to why Modi has power. It is it gives people meaning, and I think this is something for us on the left and the center. We have to grapple with the fact that the right wing across the world, I think, is doing a better job at handling modernity than we are in terms of giving people meaning. Like, so when I watch these kids every evening show up to the RSS meetings, which I attended, um, 
they're showing up and they have a place to go. They have people who are nurturing them. They have, you know, through the the identity with their religion, they have a, a, a they have like a a story and a a real purpose, right? And I think sometimes the left, and this is certainly true in India, doesn't have a counterweight to that, right? We don't have this like a coherent story that we're telling, which we could get to in terms of the problems with the left in India. But Modi is is. Like if, if if this were like a Terminator analogy, he's like the T-1000 from Terminator 2. Like he is a different, much more powerful version of populism than Trump ever could be. He is more popular. He is he is the real deal in terms of his connection to everything he says, right? He believes it where I, I have serious questions about what Trump believes or doesn't believe. He has a very coherent ideology. He's extremely disciplined. You talk to people who are in Modi's camp, he'll sit through six hours of meetings and not go to the bathroom. He's just like on it. Um, he truly grew up poor and talks about it in a way that like the most effective populists can. More, but most importantly, uh, the right wing and the left, the right wing in, in India and the right wing in the US have some marked differences. The most important is the right wing populists in India are truly populist in the sense that they have a digital welfare scheme where they're sending payments to the poor. They've expanded infrastructure. So like the mythical sort of infrastructure week that Trump has is, is actually a real thing in India. They also have uh, massive spending on uh, renewable energy. Like when I was at the RSS headquarters, they were hosting a climate conference. So it's like these are types of things that you would not see in the right wing. And because of that, I think they have more staying power. Not that you know we're, we're obviously going to be dealing with our right wing for the rest of our lives. But Modi, I think, is much more deeply entrenched and like his his people are more deeply entrenched and they're of a much different variety. I think they are just more authentic. It's not it's not to say that they're I love what they're doing, but they cert, they have a they have a coherence and a substance that I don't think our right wing in the US has. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I, I've been, and I've been doing a lot of reading about India lately, you know, maybe in part because I've been listening to this podcast and you know, there's real grievances yes. about uh, uh not just a deep-seated, you know, poverty, but you know, India's gone through a succession of humiliations and colonizations, um, suppression of Hindu identity, you know, for hundreds of years. And, and, and Nehru and Gandhi and the Congress party, they, they kind of dealt with the British um, and then tried to channel that into a kind of a secular democracy, but clearly it didn't, didn't hit deep enough uh, for people, some people. And, and, and what you're describing, I think is exactly right. The question I have for you is, you know, this you set out to answer the mystery of what happened in this murder, and you kind of, I, I think, found something bigger and richer, which is a mystery of what happened to India. Um, and and the question is, where is it going? So we're talking now towards the end of the Indian election. Modi looks poised to win. He's been particularly banging the anti-Muslim drum of late. We talked about that with Rana Yub recently. Yeah. Where do you see this going? And and what would you say, you know, to people in on the Indian center and left or in the Congress party or in the opposition uh, uh, about, you know, as a political person, like what would they also need to be doing differently going forward? Yeah. Oh man. In some ways it reminds me a lot of the fights that we have at home. It really is a global struggle, but, um, you know, when I think about, you know, what you mentioned, like the, the, the mystery at the heart of this case, right? It was 2014 when lawyers, this case was going through this, uh, the courts and, and all the stuff that we investigate happened. It was the exact pivot point when Modi actually, and the way that the, the case was dealt with, the dividing line was when Modi came to power. Basically, Shah looked like he was going to be held accountable for this alleged murder uh, that he was, he was um, originally charged with. And then Modi comes to power, the impunity starts. It's it's this case in many ways straddles the difference between the Gandhian pluralism of the past and the Modi era. Now, not knowing what the election results will be, but based on what it, everybody seems to think, which is that the BJP will win, uh, although there's a big question about whether they'll have to form a coalition government, there are a couple of things that are going to be notable in the future here. Number one is the Congress Party uh, is really a political dynasty. Uh, Nehru, his daughter Indira Gandhi, her son Rajiv Gandhi, uh, then Sonia Gandhi, who a lot of people allege was really behind the Mohan Singh government, the last Congress party government, and then now Rahul Gandhi. It's basically 70 years of one family running the party that was basically running the country. And Modi, like any good populist, grabbed onto that and was like, and like, I think any good populist is going to take some truth 
And then they're going to add a bunch of crazy to it, which I think is what Modi has done uh, more effectively than anybody in the world. And the, the, the real challenge for the opposition in India is to give them less truths to deal with that you aren't um, speaking to. And the economists and a lot of people who are really good observers of India think this could be the last Gandhi in Rahul. And no offense to Rahul Gandhi. I'm, I, I have no personal negative feelings about him, but I think that the people of India want new blood in the politics. And so when you think of the future, my sense is there's this, this India, which is an acronym coalition, which is a bunch of different parties. What I would love to see come out of this race is that no more political dynasty. Let's get some new voices, maybe even new parties, right? There are some really interesting new parties like that chief minister in Delhi um, that could create a new narrative. Now, as for Modi, uh, he, if he, no, you know, unless he loses, he's going to come out emboldened. And I think there's going to be an economic message, which uh, he's really going to push manufacturing. He has a real economic problem. There's a there's mythology about how good econ uh, India's economy really is, which, if you know, if we want, we could talk about. But he he will certainly lean more into the Hindu nationalism, and there, he's been alluding to like big plans after the election, which we'll have to wait and see. So I think that things could get a lot worse in terms of the authoritarian bend of the country after this election. Yeah, uh, it feels like that way. It's uh, it's going to get worse for potentially it can get better. Um, but look, I, I, I just want to congratulate you. It's such a great podcast. I love limited series podcasts, the, the ability to tell a story and let it breathe a little bit. Yeah. So I just uh, want to, again, uh, recommend everybody go check out Killing Justice, this new limited series from Crooked Media and the Branch. Uh, episodes one and two are already out on Apple and Spotify. Uh, subscribe to it so you get in your feed. Don't miss an episode. You can get ad-free episodes uh, on our friend of the pod community at cricket.com slash friends. Uh, but Ravi, congratulations to you and the team. I know it's been a long and winding road. Oh, thank you, Ben. It's not easy to do things. It's <laughs> not easy to report in India. Uh, it's risky. It's complicated. Uh, it's politically fraught. Um, there's actually a great uh, Vox. Uh, uh, Zach Beauchamp has a good uh, investigation out about how the Indian government um, it kind of intimidates people, it critics yes. in other countries. I saw that. Yeah. 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 They'll be coming for me soon. So yeah, if I get if I get arrested in the next few weeks, everybody knows what it's about. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, we can vouch for your character otherwise. So that's <laughs> that's what it's about. Um, but you were courageous among everything else. So congratulations for that. Thank you, my friend. Thanks to Ravi Gupta. Thanks to the Prime Minister, and thanks to Fareed for joining us. I will see you next week.